Hello everyone, today is Thursday, August 27, 2015, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week I really, really made it. I have so much to cover, but um, I'm out of Mountain Dew once again, so I'm just going to have to, uh, I guess I'll just have to wing it. I think I have enough energy today that will get me through it without being jacked up on the Mountain Dew. Okay. There's the obligatory disclaimer screen. Let me just sum it up for you real quick. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what are we going to talk about? Well, we have another Death Cross update. Um, You know, it never ceases to amaze me. And it's funny, the longer I'm at this business, the simpler and simpler I find things are. And I never said easy, but it just keeps getting simpler. And I think that early in my career, like many of us, I tried to complicate things. And even this morning, when I was doing some last-minute research uh, to, to show you in this show, I found myself using a rate of change and then percentage changes and all kinds of uh, complex things, as opposed to just looking at the chart. And I'll flesh that out in just one second. But it's amazing how something as simple as a trigger can often keep capital out of harm's way. And it's something that we should never forget about. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, bow ties is obviously the big thing right now with everyone because of the way the market's rolling over and all, and everybody's busy dusting off all their emerging trend things uh, set up, such as first thrust bow ties, etc. So I, I seem to be getting a lot of questions on that. So I want to talk about how just with any signal or setup, you have first you have the signal, then you have the setup, and then you have the trigger, and that's going to make more sense in just a minute. Um. Lately, I've been looking at a lot of simple ways, such as daylight and moving averages and the bow tie moving averages of staying on the right side of the market. I want to flesh that flesh that out a little bit. Um, I want to talk a little bit about confirmed tops. That's something I mentioned recently, and I think that's an important concept to understand. And keep in mind, one thing I was thinking about just before the show, all these things, you don't want to rush out. And, and make this a mechanical system, and this is all you do is follow these things. Although you might, you probably would do okay longer term. You certainly would beat 90% of the money managers who just follow the market down in a year like 2008. But your goal is to be a little bit better than that, obviously, and use these signals as sort of a framework to work around. So would you see that we have a longer term moving average turning down? or a bow tie on a weekly chart, or a two-day chart, or a three-day chart, or even a one-day chart off all-time highs, just know that you probably want to be on the other side of the market. You probably want to be on the downside of the market, the short side of the market. And at the least, at the least, you certainly want to be very selective on new longs. And I'm going to flesh all that out in just one second. Instead of telling you what I'm going to tell you, let's just let me just tell you here. First of all, this was a recent setup. As I, as I say each week, 99.9% .9 of all my examples, individual stock examples at least, come straight from my trading service, my core trading service. And this was an IPO issue. It had a nice little breakout in here and then kind of made a little bit of what I call a double top knockout. A double top knockout is simply where you have market makes a new high and then has a few days in between. And usually, ideally, you want to see about four days in between. This is only three. But it did have kind of a marginal high here, too. So it depends on how you want to count that. But it just kind of makes this little flat top looking thing. And then you have a knockout move. So it's a thrust up, a little bit of flat out, kind of like a pie. It kind of looks like pie, you know, makes a little pie. And then you have the knockout move afterwards. So this was a setup. But notice what happened. It just, even if you just entered right above the high, and remember, with the setup, and we trade mostly pullbacks, right? With the setup, the textbook way would be to enter right above the high like that. A better way would be to enter a little bit higher. So just in case the market maker or whoever, some manipulation comes in and pushes that market higher, trying to trigger in people, by having that slightly higher entry, you will avoid a losing trade but in this particular case even a textbook entry right above the high 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 would never have triggered and obviously on this day here 
would you pull all the way back to the prior base? And this is why I took this off of my recommended list. It's no longer a setup. So it amazes me how many times no trigger, no trade. Now, novice traders, I'll recommend a stock on this day here. And then at the end of the day, I'll get an email. Hey, Dave, I bought it close to 33. You know, it's like, isn't that great? I'm like, no, no, it didn't trigger because they think they say, okay, entry at, let's just use 35 to keep the math easy. Entry at 35 minus 33, where they got in, equals $2. They saved $2. No, 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 no. No, you would have lost a lot more than $2 by trying to buy it early. So it's not like you're trying to catch that falling knife when the market begins to pull back. And that's the beauty of a pullback is sometimes market – sorry. Sometimes the market just keeps pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back. And, as I said earlier, no capital gets put into harm's way. So that's one. And guess what? We had two examples this week on no trigger. This is a little gold stock. You know, here's the thing. Market's looking a little questionable. No, there's no uh, arguing that. We're going to talk a lot about that in a few minutes. Just hang in there. So what kind of stocks do you want to be in? Well, on the long side, you want to be in stocks that could do two things. Trade contra to the overall market, such as metals and mining. Now, you don't just rush out and buy metals and mining stocks or gold stocks or silver stocks. Just because they can trade contra to the market, you still need to have, what? A setup. So in this particular stock, AUY, we had a uh, first thrust type of setup. Think about it also in a bow tie. And then it, it didn't trigger, didn't trigger. And then now we're all the way back here to new lows, and we're probing new lows and making new lows. So that's an avoided trade. It's no longer a setup. Now, speaking of setups, I was asked a few questions recently with the bow tie. Now, the bow tie, we just have these moving averages that begin to roll over. And where they all come together, it kind of makes like a bow tie, okay, or looks like a bow tie. So if you had a little, little guy, a little stick figure, that would be a bow tie. So the question was, When you have the bow tie, does that mean you should sell the market? And no, that's just your signal. Just like when you have a first thrust, meaning that a market's chugging along, chugging along, makes an all-time high or a significant high, and then sells off hard, that's just your signal that the trend may be changing. You don't sell a market just because this happens. If you do, you'll get caught up in a lot of whipsaw for the most part. What you do is you wait for a setup. Now, everything we do is, is pullback related. So you have a signal, a setup, you have the pullback, and then, as we just discussed, you have a trigger. No trigger, no trade. So the bow tie crossing is your signal. The first thrust down, the market sells off hard, that's your signal. Your setup doesn't happen until that market begins to pull back. Just like right now, the S&P, the indices are all pulled back. That's your setup. Your trigger is going to be when they take out their recent lows. And I'll flesh that out in a second. Any questions on trigger setups versus signals, et cetera? All right. Let me just start into the next slide, and then uh, we'll let everybody get caught up. Um, recently, I talked about confirmed tops, and for lack of a better word. And let's say you do have that signal, that setup, the trigger, okay? Once that market triggers or stock or whatever, mark, I use the word market. It could be anything, gold, forex, okay? Markets are markets. Technical analysis, you're simply reading the, the mind of the market, and it doesn't matter what that market is. Now, I prefer – trading individual stocks because they're more inefficient. But indices and Forex and gold and these other markets can 
set up nicely and tactical analysis can be used in them it just tends to work better in more inefficient markets now I don't want to digress too far I'll be getting some, some questions on Forex lately uh, my favorite thing to do at Forex would be to look to buy a market after it's making major 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 lows and then you get that bow tie you don't try to catch the bottom but you wait for the bow tie or conversely uh, the pair is making major major highs if it gets to roll over okay and that that goes for Forex gold or any other inefficient market so like gold right now it's kind of scraping bottom Gold to commodity. If gold to commodity begins to rally off its lows and makes a bow tie, we could have a serious buying opportunity. If not, just let it go and stay out of its way. So once you have a market makes a new high, sells off, that's your signal. Here's your setup. Here's your trigger. Once it takes out that prior low, then that retrace high is going to be I don't want to call it a line in the sand, but an area where you want to watch. Now, it doesn't mean that you won't get stopped out of your trade, but if you're just kind of looking at the market to see if it's still a top, it's a top as long as it doesn't take out that retrace high. So this area here will be a top. And then right before I published this slide, I, I decided to put until proven otherwise. So obviously, if the market goes on to make new highs, then that top is no longer a top. So Rusty 2000, right now we're looking at the possible or a definite bow tie to work on like a two-day chart. And it took out those recent lows. We're going to look at all this in one second. So, so far, it's a confirmed top. And then the other indices, same sort of action too. So this is kind of a textbook, nearly perfect bow tie on a two-day chart. Now, why two-day, you may be asking. Well, I'm glad you asked. The Russell and the other indices for that matter, but especially the Russell has been really choppy throughout this year. And when a market gets really choppy, you're looking at a one-day chart. Sometimes I start hitting my, my number two key, my number three key, my number four key, my number five key. So that gives you a two-day chart, a three-day chart, a four-day chart, and a five-day chart respectively. Five days, obviously, is one week's worth of trading. So a five-day chart is a weekly chart. So you can see in the Russell 2000, we had a, a new high here. We had a new high here. We had a thrust down. And then we also had the bow tie, okay? So you have first a thrust. That counts as a signal, okay? The bow tie counts as a signal. And then the setup would be when you begin to make higher highs and higher lows. In other words, when the market pulls back. The trigger is when that market begins to roll back over, it takes out its recent lows, okay? So once it takes out the low of the signal, okay, the signal being here, then that retrace is a confirmed, confirms the top. And that stays in place until the top is taken out. Now, you don't necessarily, if you're fortunate enough to take a signal like this, and the market's way down here. You don't sit around and wait for it to make new highs. You obviously need to take some profits along the way. And you obviously need to trail a stop along the way. A long-term moving average could be a good trailing stop, by the way. That's another thing I was looking at this week. I'm going to show you some real simple techniques to keep you on the right side of the trend. But when you're getting into a trade, it's 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 a little bit more complex. You want to have that kind of like that bow tie signal or whatever the signal may be, setup, trigger, etc. But once you're in the trade, try to keep it as simple as possible with your longer term trade following. Because as I've been preaching lately, everything works better with trade. I have an article came out today in Proactive Trader Magazine. If you're if you're my Facebook friend, I just put it on Facebook. Um, I need to remind myself when I get done with the seminar to put it up on Twitter. And it's a one little page article on the bow ties and the, and the longer term moving averages in the S&P 500. Real simple stuff. But in doing this type of research, it just kind of made me realize that, well, first of all, as I preach quite often, everything works better with trend. And I talk about that in the article, too. So once you're in a trend, don't overcomplicate things and try to figure out when exactly that trend's going to end. Just follow along and follow along or trail along kind of loosely 
and even let that stop open up a little bit so you can stay with that trend for hopefully a long, long time. But again, everything works better with trend. So once you're in that trend, just use something simple, something as simple as a uh, moving average can help to keep you out of trouble. I think I just fat figured something. Let me just see something. Oh, I did. No problem. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so getting back to that Russell 2000 or any other market, once you're in that trend, just use something simple to keep you in the trend. And what's kind of cool is when you start stair-stepping that stop down and let it widen out a little bit, eventually it's going to start looking like a longer term moving average. Okay. I'm often asked that when I put a stop on a chart. So a lot of times when I put a stop, I used to in the old days, if I had a stop on a chart and I was doing a presentation, I'd go in and painstakingly recreate where the stop was every day. So the stop would look something like this or the chart. But nowadays I just kind of eyeball it and go back in and get an idea where I had it. And then I just kind of end up drawing this kind of like a, a line that looks like this, kind of connecting the longer term dots. And a lot of people often ask me, is that a longer term moving average? And that's the beauty of teaching is that I learn a lot too. And the answer is no, but in reality, that stop begins to look like a longer term moving average. So, and everybody's trying to quantify things, trying to quantify things, which I suggest that you don't. But if you are newer to trading and you need some kind of way to wrap your head around it, then by all means, yes, start with a shorter term moving average for your protective stop and then widen that out into a longer term moving average because in reality, that's what the stop's going to look like as we widen it out to ride the trend out. So hopefully that made sense. All right, death cross. Like I said in my column the other day, I think this gets way too much media coverage because of its silly name. And as I put in my column, I put a hot chick in a, in a bikini because I think the next time I come up with a pattern, I'm going to call it the hot chick in a little bikini just so I get some coverage, <laughs> some excitement. Or steal a page out of my buddy uh, Bollinger's book, put my name on it. My wife's been telling me forever, when are you going to put your name on a pattern? <laughs> so I need to do that. I keep forgetting. Anyway, Death Cross, before I digress too far. All it is is a 50-day moving average crossing a 200-day moving average. Somebody called it a Death Cross, and it stuck. And the media gets very excited about this. Well, we did have one, obviously, back here. And then if you go watch last week's week of charts, I think we had two since 2009. And obviously, the market's had a pretty good run since 2009. So it doesn't mean the end of the world. But this or any other type of, of, of signal, let's just call them a signal, a tr possible trend change signal, you should certainly pay attention to it. Now, before I get too far into my moving average talk, which we're going to talk a lot about today, keep in mind that all <laughs> – Phil says, hot chicken in a bikini has little coverage in reality. Oh, that's – that's uh, he's cute. That's cute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, that's going to make me digress. Let me uh, get back. <laughs> Stay focused, Dave. Um, before we talk about moving averages too much – just keep in mind that all indicators have lag, and you want to pay attention to price first and foremost. Like I often say, when a market sells off hard, always look for the first thrust first. Now, if a market's kind of gradually rolling over, then the moving averages specifically, or especially the bow tie moving averages, could do a wonderful thing to, to indicate that the market might be rolling over. In fact, let me just change that word. Instead of using the word indicate to illustrate that the market might be rolling over. So when you first look at a chart and you see this, you might not, you might see more, your eye might be drawn to this, okay, and not so much to this. And, and by the way, I don't want to digress too far, but that's a problem when you're studying oscillators or, or anything like that or any other indicator for that matter, even stuff that I've invented. We tend to be 
optimistic as human beings. And that's a good thing. Nobody wants to be around a pessimist. I was going to be a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out. But you have to be really careful when you're studying those type of things because a lot of times your eye is drawn to the times where it works and you don't really notice all the times that it didn't work. So once you think you do have some sort of a system, work to work to pick it apart, okay? People email me their systems and I kind of start picking them apart and then they defend their system. You know, instead what they should be doing is like, Dave, I never thought about that or Dave, that's a good point. Hmm, I wonder how I would feel psychologically when that happened. But instead, they're like, oh, but Dave, it still made money. I mean, yeah, it drew down 40%, but so what? It still made money for the year. It's like, well, wait a minute. Okay. You got a wife and kids at home, <laughs> and, you're lo and you've lost 40% of your money? Uh how, how's that going to make you feel in reality? It's pretty easy to see that happen on a chart, but in reality, it becomes much different. So just be careful when you think you have observed something. And it's not my way or highway. I'm not trying to sell you exactly on what I'm doing. I'm telling you it does take some um, discretion and common sense and other things, okay? So just be really careful if you when you start when and if you venture too much into the, the – um, mechanical type of systems and just be leery of any type of system even stuff I'm going to show you today just make sure you fully wrap your head around how it works anyway long story endless you can see death cross is getting closer but you know what's kind of interesting is the 200 day moving average has already turned down in here and I want to talk about the 250 day moving average or 50 week moving average in just one second but yes we could have the dreaded death cross really soon now this is coming off of all-time highs. And any signal you get off of all-time highs, sh you should heed, okay, or certainly pay attention to, because the most amount of people are going to be trapped on the wrong side of the market. And then you probably have a lot of – probably. Did I just say probably? <laughs> a lot of these middle-aged ladies on uh, – not to pick on you ladies, but uh, for some reason, you middle-aged ladies on Facebook use the word probably a lot, P-R-O-L-O-Y. Anyway – you probably have a lot of people that are on the wrong side of the market. And when you see a base at high levels like this, there's probably a lot of people that were a little late to the game trying to get in. So when you have a transitional setup or some sort of rollover type of setup after a long, long extended trend like this, then obviously the most amount of people are going to be on the wrong side of the market. And that's why – as I just said a few minutes ago, in a more efficient market like Forex or gold or whatever you want to trade, that's more efficient and overtraded, okay? And traders tend to mostly cancel each other out. You want to be taking those signals off of major highs and major lows and let everybody else fight it out in the meantime, okay? Great copy. Thank you, Brian. Okay, uh, any questions on that before we talk about overhead resistance? This morning I started putting together um, a graphic on the significance of overhead supply. And my graphic was kind of looking kind of strange. And I had one arrow going up and one arrow going down and one arrow going some other way. I'm trying to do it as a figure. Then it just kind of dawned on me. Let me just show you what the significance is on a chart. I often call it overhead resistance because the market's going to hit resistance or should hit resistance when it hits that overhead area. Uh, supply is probably a better way of or better name for it. And by the way, I was looking at one of my old columns. Um, and I had uh, older columns for a few weeks back or a few months back. And I had the supply and demand um, arrows drawn supply and demand. Really, that's all you have to understand when it comes to markets. It's just supply and demand. Now, I know it's a little bit more complex than that when you go to place an order and put a stop in, trail a stop, wait for an entry, recognize a setup, the whole nine yards. But boil it all down, and we're just dealing with supply and demand in the markets now. You know, fundamentalists say, oh, you must pay attention to fundamentals. Okay, well, what could be more fundamental than supply and demand, okay? 
So nothing magical about technical analysis, at least the way I do it. You have to have some sort of conceptually correct concept when you're looking at a chart, okay? It's not a, it's not a fat man with a little baby and a poopy diaper or something like that. No, it has to mean something that makes sense. Now, if the fat man with a little baby with a poopy diaper means that maybe supply has exhausted itself or demand has exhausted itself or something like that, then I can wrap my heads around, head around that. Wrap my heads around that? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's better be careful to keep this uh, PG-13, right? Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, I can wrap my head around that if it's some sort of supply and demand being met or exhausted along those lines. So anyway, when you do have a range like this, traders usually don't tend to agree for long. And this is one of the longest times that I've seen a range uh, in my career. And uh, I probably say that every time the market goes into range just because it, it's painful to be a trade follower and watch the market just chop along day after day after day after day. Uh, but the chances are pretty good that a lot of people bought – stocks during this range. So what happens is when the market begins to drop below that range, anyone who bought during the range is now not a happy camper. By the way, I'm just thinking about this. I have a pattern called the Go Go Nomo under free reports on my website. And um there's a banner ad on today's site you can click on to get that and I had forgotten about it, but in that article, uh, which is a shorting strategy, I did talk a lot about overhead supply. So there's some pretty good graphics in there, too. I wish I thought about it before I did the show. I'd, I'd put those in today's show. But go ahead and check out that report if you get a chance. So the significance of overhead supply is really, A, the longer this market goes sideways, the more – think about it, too. This gets perceived as like a value zone or where a stock should be. And then when you break out of that zone, you now have this disequilibrium. Easy for me to say, disequilibrium. Now, so significance of overhead supply is first, A, how long you're in that supply, and then B, how far you go below that supply. So if you just kind of dip below it a little bit, nobody gets too excited. In fact, that might actually attract some value players, some more buyers into the market. But when you, begin, when you begin to drop significant, good thing I didn't have the Mountain Dew today. When you begin to drop significantly below that overhead supply, then things change a little bit. People begin to wake up. My phone is ringing now. Hey, Dave, you're okay. Yeah, I'm fine. Um, I I short markets. I have stops. I've uh, been really selective during this range. This is okay for me. This is good that the market is actually doing something yes you know like the little country girl used to they used to say if i had my rathers well if i had my rathers i'd rather this market would be going higher okay but you have to play the hand that is dealt so people are beginning to wake up so this b thing is the wake up thing the wake up call and then the c thing is also the wake up call so the further you stay below it and the longer you stay below it kind of like this and like that the more important it becomes. So it's A plus B plus C. So long-winded way of saying that this overhead supply is now significant. Again, let's say you just drop below it and then pop right back above it. People don't have time to act. People are slow to act, by the way. Like I wrote my column on – when was the last column? Wednesday, yesterday. Um, or, or Monday, I forget when. But people probably – uh, sold their stocks at 666 in the piece in March of 2009, right before, of course, we had the mother of all bottoms because they just couldn't take the water torture of down day after day after day after day. People are, people are kind of late in their decision-making process, especially when it comes to the markets. They're always like, it'll come back, it'll come back. Well, they say it always comes back. Well, yeah, it might. But it might go down 50% in the meantime. And as long as you don't retire the year that it goes down 50%, you might be okay. Might be in the keyword 
in that sentence, okay? So that's overhead supply in a nutshell. Now, those of you who've been around for a while, my apologies. I, at one point, somebody said, Dave, stop showing the weekly bow ties. You're killing me. But now it's very relevant, and I think it's time to dust them off once again. And if you look at the bow ties on a weekly basis, and you look back at the more recent bull and bear cycles, obviously we had one in 2000, pretty serious sell-off afterwards. We had one in 2003. This was a beautiful one because the market took two years to bottom. This was a wonderful bottom in the market. So it wasn't fun trying to trade that bottom, although I think I think we did okay. I'll have to go back and look um, because we did have some big swings in there. But I'd much rather have a nice rip-roaring bull market like we had after 2002, 2003. But you got the signal here, and then you had a pretty good run. And then in late 2007, we got the – Signal and then the trigger was in early 2008, right around here. Go back and study your own charts, and then you can see you did have a little retrace in here, but notice it never did take out the prior highs or the prior retrace in here. It had a nice, nice sell off. And then in 2009, the bow tie on a weekly basis, it took a little while to catch up to the market, but the market still doubled since then. Okay, now one other point, real quick. If you squint your eyes, you'll see there was one here and one here. But these are major signals. When I'm talking about all-time highs or like five and ten-year lows, okay, or all-time highs, or this was, I think, a 13-year low right here. So those are your major signals. Your minor signals, you should not ignore them, but they're not as important as a major signal. Now, if we zoom into the chart, if you zoom in right here, you'll see that this is what the bow tie looks like in the S&P 500. Like I said, uh, quite a bit recently, because this is a great thing about being an organization like the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts. You get to rub elbows with some of these uh, these uh, guys that have been around for a while, smart guys, uh, far more smarter than me. But uh, like Greg Morris taught me that these exponential moving averages – will turn the moment the price crosses below them. Now, like in this particular case, it's kind of hard to see right here, but notice the price crossed below it. And let me just take out my drawings here. You can see that if you squint your eyes, it did actually turn down. So they will catch up the price pretty quick. I do like a simple 10-day moving average, just so, just because it gives me a true representation of the price of the last 10 days. I'm often asked why I chose these. I just doodled with a lot of different ones. This is what I came up with. But I like the 10 simple because I want to see what the price is actually doing in the last 10 days. And then with the longer term moving average, the 20 would be a, a one month. And I did a lot of research early in my career on the 20-day moving average. And I'm noodled around with that quite a bit. My first article that I ever wrote for Stocks and Commodities magazine, for any magazine in that matter, on technical analysis at least, was in 1994, 1995, I think. And it was a 220 EMA breakout system where you use a two-day gap above or below that moving average to get into a market. And so I was fascinated with it for a long, long time. So that's how the 20 came to be. And I liked it because it's one month's worth of trading. And then the 30 gives you six weeks worth of trading. So that's a pretty good time frame on an intermediate term basis. So we got short, medium, and intermediate term time basis. And when these three come together cross over, a lot of times – you could have something significant in the works. For instance, in 2003, I forgot that I zoomed this in, but you can look down here. Long-term moving averages are headed lower, and then all of a sudden they turn real quick, come together at a fulcrum, and then they begin to spread out again. Okay, So that's your bow tie in a nutshell. So we could be getting a weekly signal. Now, as I talked about in the article, they had to reduce it down a little bit because of the, um, the length of it, so some of this was missing. but I've seen quite a few presentations where the the guy presenting is uh, showing a, a chart with like 100 buy and sell signals on it. And I don't want to beat the person up because they've probably discovered something significant and they probably have an edge. OK, otherwise, I can't imagine they'd be up there showing it to you. So I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. But in many cases, you'll see like, you know. 
buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. You know, the chart's all marked up like this. And if you look at that longer term moving average or even a shorter term moving average, you'll say, well, why not just buy here and then, you know, sell when it breaks below it, okay, significantly. Or even, you know, buy here, sell here, buy here, sell here. So two or three trades over 10 years versus all that in and out, okay. No, uh, these are not – I'm looking at a simple moving average now. This is uh, – yeah, see, I often, it's it's so funny. It's like I know people, everybody's eyes glaze over when I talk about what they are, but you got to realize that not everybody knows my stuff. This is a 20 EMA, and this is a 30 EMA. 10, 20, 30, simple, and then EMA, EMA, exponential, exponential. Don't worry about the math. Let your computer calculate it for you. But anyway, I've seen a lot of presentations where you have all these buy and sells, and it makes me realize that everything works better with trend. So I kind of ended up giving myself a dose of my own medicine. I still love my bow ties, and I'm not going to abandon them. I'm still going to use them, especially because I think they catch up the price a lot faster than something like a simple moving average just in and of itself. And then the three moving averages gives you a little bit of an edge there. But one thing I did notice is that in, in working, doing all this work with the bow ties, if you just follow the slope of the 50-day moving average, it would be up here, it would be down here, it would be up here, it would be down here, it would be up here, okay, for the most part. And now you're beginning to get a little bit of a downtick. Uh, this morning, I actually caught myself going into my old self. I was trying to quantify the 50-day moving average. And before you know it, I'm doing a rate of change, and I'm doing all these other things on it. I'm like, no, just just eyeball it and use common sense. If it's generally headed up, you want to be long the market. If it's generally headed down, you want to be short the market. One other point, too, by the way, uh, daylight is a wonderful concept, too. Daylight is simply that lows are greater than the moving average. That's something that was originally discovered, and uh, a friend of mine or, or someone who I became friendly with who read the article called it Daylight. Um, guy by the name of Joe over in the Bronx and in, uh, in, uh, up in New York. And he just calls it daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average. You can see daylight between the low and the moving average. So here you would have upside daylight, almost this entire trend. Here you would have downside daylight, except for one little kiss right here, almost this entire trend. And by the way, that's a system in and of itself. Wait for a market to kiss the moving average and go back in the direction of the moving average. You know, It doesn't have to be that complex to be a trend follower. In fact, I would encourage you to keep it as simple as possible. That's why I bought the trademark Trading Simplify and added it to my website, and added it to my website in case you've noticed. But now we're beginning to tick down in a moving average. So it doesn't mean it's the end of the world, but it kind of is an interesting signal. And then go back in time. We had a few tick downs throughout this, oh, I don't know what I have here, about uh, 20 years or so charts. We had a few tick downs. But for the most part, if you just followed the slope of that moving average, that would have done a pretty good job of keeping you on the right side of the market. And, you know, I'll keep picking on these money managers and, uh, managers, and I guess they had no choice. I don't know. I don't know what the charters are or what happens. They probably hated their lives during 2008. But they had no choice, maybe, I don't know, to ride the market down. If they're long only and they have to be 100% long at all times, well, at one point in 2008, as I wrote Layman's Guide to Trading Stocks, nothing was higher. And so, <laughs> and many things were, were headed even lower. So, if you have to be 100% in stocks, then I guess you're just a hurt and pup. But the point I'm trying to make is that something simple like this can at least tell you what side of the market you should be on. Doesn't mean you're going to print money doing it, but it certainly can keep you from fighting a market, okay? And that's where you get into a lot of trouble when you fight a market. I mean, getting back to, again, last thing, I'm not going to beat the horse too much more in 2008. <clears throat> but certainly, let's say by this point here, even if you were a little late to realize things like, oh, wait a minute, this thing, you know, this moving average is dropping like a stone. The bow tie moving average it had crossed over a long time ago, and you took out, these lows and everything. So at that point, at some point, you got to start asking yourself, geez, is this market in trouble? And even if you let yourself get taken out here, you save yourself a lot of grief by riding that, by not riding that 50% drop lower. Okay. 
Uh, I'm going to start on the random thoughts. Any questions on anything we covered so far? Um, if not, we'll hop into the charts just one second. If you guys want to start asking sto uh, about individual stocks, please feel free to start doing that now. Just ask about a stock and hit return. I'm going to spend a few minutes looking at the overall market. It shouldn't take more than a few minutes because we've already talked about them quite a bit. And then uh, we'll hop into the individual stocks. Um, one thing that's a bit of a bummer right now is there's no place to run, no place to hide. Even gold, you just saw that gold stock. We have one on the radar for today that we're going to try to uh, take a stab at on an entry. But for the most part, there's really no place to run, no place to hide. Even gold is going back to test its old lows. Now, here's the other thing, too. Retrace rallies will be fierce. Like yesterday, we were up 4%. And that's a pretty significant market move. But don't get too excited about that unless you're doing like opening gap reversal trading, which I'm not a huge fan of day trading. But if you do get a little gift where the futures are like up a bazillion points and then you know that it's just going to kind of evaporate soon or it has that feeling to it, then go ahead and play that gap. That's fine for what I would call a S and G day trade. That's not going to be your bread and butter. But that's a little something you could do for fun every now and then. But if, for the most part, I would avoid day trading. But don't get too caught up in these retrace rallies. Take things one day at a time. I mean, this is something that took me a long time to learn. Don't try to make a big picture or prediction when it comes to the markets. Just follow along. And one day at a time, it's a developing situation. Um, it's not looking good right now, okay? I hate to say put a gun to my head. My wife hates when I say that. But put a gun to my head. Has the market topped? Yeah, I think so. Okay. But if this market continues to rally, it goes through that overhead supply, then I'm going to change my tune. I mean, I guess that's how I got the name, Trend Following Moron, because I don't try to outsmart the market. I no longer try to look smart. I just follow along. And uh, Gary Kaltbaum wrote some really nice things about me that I put in a column recently. He wrote them back in 2003. I'd forgotten that he'd written that. And then um, it was picked up in a more uh, recent column and uh, by a, a fellow over at uh, Raymond James. What's his name? Oh, I'm so bad with names. Once I start the show, <laughs> I'll find uh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Salt, I think. S-A-U-T? Anyway, uh, where it's like, you know, Gary was singing my praise and saying I'm wrong. I'm right. I'm wrong. No, I'm right more often than I'm wrong, but it doesn't mean I'm not wrong. When I'm wrong, I recognize that I'm wrong. I admit that I'm wrong, and then I move on. Admit that you're wrong, and then move along. And if the market starts going back up, then maybe you should start looking to get long again. Okay. Now, sell first and ask questions later. Something I like to preach. But that doesn't mean that you just bail out at the first signs of adversity. If you did that, you would never, ever, never capture a trend. My biggest regret in my first book, I was making a list of like nine rules. And I needed one more. And then I thought, oh, when in doubt, get out would probably be a good thing to say. And then I realized that. Yeah, that's a good thing to say when you're in a rip-roaring bull market like we were back in 99 when that book was written. But once things get a little choppy, that's not necessarily the best thing to do. When in doubt, tough it out. Now, by tough it out, I don't mean fight the market. By tough it out, I mean honor your stop. And if you're stopped out, you're stopped out. But if you're not stopped out, tough it out by staying in the market. So... Sell first and ask questions later. If I, you hear me say that, what I'm saying, what I mean is honor your stops. If you get stopped out, you get stopped out. That's your sell first. Sell first is not when things tick down a little bit, you want to bail out. Even with this big rollover that looks like a potential top, we still have one long on that fortunately we did get stopped out of. And maybe that will turn into the mother of all winners for this year. Who knows? We'll see. Okay. Jim says, how should the market act if it act if it goes back to supply, turn back down, or go sideways as traders sell to break even? Well, um, let's just think about it in terms of supply and demand. So 
the, my point is that, you know, first of all, like, what's his name? Justice Pod or Stewart. We'll know when we see it. So we could, we could speculate as to what would happen all we want. We won't know until it happens or if it happens, okay? The point is that put in your negative column the fact that we have a mountain of overhead supply and it's be a hard, the market's going to have a hard time getting through this overhead supply. So what's going to happen here? I don't know. But you will likely get some selling when it hits that overhead supply and it's just going to be hard to get back through the market, okay? It wouldn't surprise me if, and this is a big if, but if this market retraced, to see it just kind of bounce off of that overhead supply, okay? So, yeah, we'll know when we see it, Jim. It's hard to speculate right now. Oh, good. Good question. Is S&P a, a, a TKO or a reversal? I did not. I was supposed to put that chart. I'm so glad you reminded me. I was supposed to put that chart into my – let me see if I could find it. I was supposed to put that chart into today's show. And I guess at the last minute, I forgot to put it in. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I think I have it in one of my recent columns. Let me show you that. Um, let's see if we can get it over here. Okay. If you read, in fact, it's, my, it's, it's Wednesday's column. Go in and read Wednesday's column, first chance you get. And if you scroll, and by the way, the, the, um, that report, the GoGo Nomo, where I talk about overhead supply is, is right here. Click on that, and you can get that free report. Um, but look right here. This is what I meant to put in my, put in my um, show. This is a monthly, believe it or not, S&P 500. So notice we had this persistent uptrend month after month after month for the most part. You had a couple of negative months in there. But for the most part, you could draw a line, which is mathematically the equivalent of linear regression on the chart. And then you had this knockout move, this TKO. Now, on a daily chart, we got out. We actually started shorting on this bar. I don't want to make it look like, hey, uh, I wasn't going to get out because it's just TKO. Because you don't know it after the time. At the time, you know it after the fact. But you never know for sure at the time. So, TKO means just a shakeout move, attracts some shorts, knocks out some nervous longs, and that could often clear the way for the market to go higher. But notice after point A, we just kind of drifted higher in here. We went higher, but it wasn't a move like this. And then we have this knockout type of move here. Well, this type of move after this little bit of a trend here is, is, isn't what I would call a trend knockout, okay? Or if it is, it's not as significant as this one because notice we went kind of straight up in here. So this is more of a knockout knockout than a trend knockout. And then the other thing, too, is notice that in this chart might be a day or two old. I don't know where we ended up in a piece. We'll have to pull it up in a second. But notice that this knockout move comes all the way back to here. In a pullback, uh, when you're trading pullbacks, what you want to see is you want to see a stair step higher pattern, something like this, okay? And if you have the stock selection course, we talked a lot about this. You don't want to see a market do this, pull back to its prior pullback, okay? That's that's not a good thing. Once that happens, you need to wait for it to kind of reset itself to go on to make new highs before you want to consider that market again. So is this a trend knockout or a trend reversal? So far, it's beginning to look like more of a trend reversal now i keep hoping it's okay to hope just don't trade off of hope but i keep hoping that this market will just go right back up and this was just yet another uh correction so as i've been preaching uh, be super selective in less than ideal conditions uh if only there were a course that that taught you how to pick stocks oh wait a minute there is so go to my store and check out the stock selection course if you get a chance i'm feeling pretty generous today um, shoot me an email if you're very interested in it, and I'll give you a year's worth of my trading service if you buy the course. And then that way, you could learn how to pick stocks by watching the course, and then you could see me pick them for a year and compare your notes to mine. So you get to see it in real time. So check that out. First chance you get. Uh, these are the actual stocks I picked, plus some more. If you look at the spreadsheet on the uh, 
in that live course what I did that. And by the way, if you ever buy a course from me, you have unlimited access to any future course on that subject. So when I redo this stock course or update it a year from now, two years from now, whenever I do it again, you'll have free access again to that. Uh, trading service, $47 trial back in place. I am doing a welcome back campaign. Uh, I'm not contacting everyone. I'm just contacting people, certain people over a, a period of time. But uh, if you are a prior client and you have not heard from me, shoot me an email. I'm making a fantastic offer to get people back into trading. And it's been kind of cool. Some people have been away from trading for a few years, and they're coming back in, and that's exciting for me uh, and them. And by the way, unlimited support on my service, on my any course that I do. That doesn't mean as – a lot of people sometimes will think it means, hey, Dave, I'm working on a trading system. Can you help me build a trading system? No, that's a different type of consulting. But if you have a question about a stock relative to the course or relative to the service, then by all means, shoot me an email. I'll be happy to answer you or just give me a phone call. All right, let's hop into the charts. Keep the stock picks coming. and I'm gonna. We've already talked quite a bit about the indices, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. And then we'll hop into the individual um Thanks. I'm gonna go to black chart. I just rather uh, for live charts. I like the black one. So let's do that. Thank you, Steve. Steve says another nice seminar. I appreciate that. I read somewhere that that people are scared, scared, scared. My little coon, my little coon ass just slipped out. My cage just slipped out. Uh, people are scared of the word webinar for some reason. So maybe we'll have to change that to live internet presentation or something. All right, let's take a look at the P's. Let's look at the micro and then work our way out a little bit to the macro. If this is your first market slide, um, it's crazy, okay? And this is this is how they work, okay? Uh, everybody rushes for the door, and then you have this big sort of uh, – Vacuum that's created for lack of a better word. Market goes straight back up. Makes you feel like, oh, everything's fine. Whew, dodge the bullet. And then, not all the time, but a lot of times it rolls right back over. So these retrace rallies are pretty common. Be careful not to get too caught up in them. We were up 4% yesterday. So far today, we're up another 2%. That's good. Like I said, let's, you know, I'm hoping that we go straight back up. And as I just spent uh, a lot of time talking about, if we do go straight back up, then a lot of these people might not even notice that the market had such a spill. Or if it goes straight back up so fast, I mean, they're going to notice with the way the media is going um, <laughs> ape shit over everything. But uh, if it does go straight back up, then they feel like, okay, I dodged a bullet. Everything's okay. No need to rush out, panic, and sell. I'm just going to hang on. Uh, I'm not going to get shaken out again. And by the way, if you go back to – maybe we could do it on a monthly chart. Obviously, if you go back to 2009, buying the dips has been a thing to do. But keep in mind, in the markets, like a lot of stuff, that will work until it don't. And right now, you got to be really careful. And by the way, you know, I've been getting a lot of emails from the spreaders. And, oh, Dave, we just sell the spreads. We're doing great. Well, you know, when you have a sell-off like this, that, that will – wipe out many months, if not years of gain. So so just be careful not to get sucked into, like I wrote a few weeks back, the church of what's happening now. But before I digress too far, obviously market pull it back a little bit after its recent slide in here. Let's put the moving averages in and let's, let's go to two-day chart, three-day chart, four-day chart. So we almost have a weekly bow tie beginning to form on the weekly chart. So that would be that could be a major signal, and that's worked pretty good for the last 20 years or so. So we need to keep an eye out for that. So this is the time to pay attention to what's really happening in the markets. Don't rush out and, and call a top and try to be here. I guess it's too late for that. Predict early and often as a lot of these guys do. Um, but, yeah, it does not look good so far. And, again, don't get too caught up in the retrace rallies. NASDAQ. Having a pretty decent day up uh, about a percent and uh, almost 2% in here. Let's take a look at a two-day, three-day. Yeah, so you almost have a bow tie to a three-day chart. You certainly have the two-day chart, which we looked at uh, in the Rusty a second ago. 
So obviously that's looking pretty ugly too. And again, getting back to the stair step thing, you go back to October. Okay. So that's, that's no longer a stair step when you go down all the way back to that prior low, like we did here. Okay. So that's looking kind of, uh, kind of ugly, but so far retrace it back up. You know what? I hope it goes through all this and we don't have to worry about all this stuff. Okay. Uh, by the way, what do we have? What did we just talk about? We talked about signal, setup, and trigger. So we got two out of three right now. We got signal. We have a daily bow tie off of all-time highs. That's significant, okay? But Davey had one back here. Yeah, but what happened? We had signal, signal current here, signal, setup, and then no trigger, okay? So you had one, two, up, no three. Now we have signal. Set up. So we're waiting for number three. If it goes straight back up, then this signal or setup, I should say, is negated. And that's why you wait for all three. You don't try to pick a top. And once you think you have a top or a bottom, whatever the case may be, you don't try to be a hero, get it early. You wait for the setup. And of course, you also wait for the entry, as I just showed. And that in and of itself can keep you out a lot of a lot of trouble. It's just it's it's that simple. I never said it was easy, okay? I dropped some F bombs already this morning, okay? If you stood next to me in my office, you'd you'd learn some new words, and words that you didn't know existed, okay? So I still get pissed off, I still get hot and mad and angry. But I try to calm myself down and as you California people say, center myself and, and just kind of look at everything and not get too caught up in the minutia. Let me just show you the sector action real quick. Let's take a look at the major bigs. These are the Morningstar industry groups, which are IntelliChart. People always ask me why I use these. I use these because they're there. And it used to be, they started with some other, Morningstar bought out this company, but there was another company that used to maintain this list. And I just, they're just cool little lists and I could, I could actually flip from the sector or the subsector to the stocks within the sector or the subsector. So for me, that's a wonderful thing. So let's say I see a little gold stock I like, okay? I can flip over to gold stocks, and I can go through all of the gold stocks if I have, if I feel inclined to see if there's anything I like better. And the reason I say all of them is, in reality, what I would do is I would sort them by volume and look at the more liquid ones if I were going to uh, think about trading one of them. Uh, but it's good to look at those sexy sisters and brothers. So that's why I use those uh, those particular sectors because they're there. I also look at some ETFs when it comes to sectors too. But these are just so darn convenient. But as you can see, pretty much all sectors, uh, there's metals and mining. You can see downtrend, pretty serious downtrend still intact there. Conglomerates, durables, non-durables, all of these areas are in pretty serious downtrends. Even foods, which a couple of weeks ago, this is why, by the way, Media General. Yeah, it used to be Media General list. And Morningstar bought them out. Um, you know, there's always a bull market somewhere is preached. And I wrote about how that's really a fallacy in layman's. And in, in, a, in a hypothetical model sense, it would be beautiful if you could, like, say, okay, market's starting to get a little iffy. Let's start moving in. Let's buy some food stocks, okay? Let's buy some of these so-called defensive stocks that can trade contra to the overall market. Because in a bear market, David, in a bear market, people still eat, right? Okay? That makes a lot of sense. Well, in theory, theory and reality or theory and practice are the same, but in reality, they're not. So this is right here. Here's a testament for, okay, just because the market's looking a little iffy or sideways, don't rush out and buy a defensive stock because guess what? So to speak, the baby gets thrown out with the bath water. So anyway, there's your foods, tobacco, even tobacco. And people are still smoking a bear market. Well, yeah, but look what happened to tobacco. It got, uh, it got annihilated. It got burned. It got smoked. <laughs> anyway, uh, banks, big slide. So just go through these at your leisure. 
And I like to look at all 239 of them, but the major bigs I like to look at and point out what's going on there, uh, the major Morningstar industry groups, when the market gets a little iffy. And as you can see, everything got decimated. Look at retail. Retail was just at brand new highs not that long ago. And then, bam, absolutely imploded. Big retrace rally, but hey, that's uh, I won't get too excited just because of that. So, again, all these areas have gotten absolutely creamed. Even our darling Apple got creamed in here. And there's your bow tie there. Okay. And it never did make it back to new highs after the bow tie. And then, pfft, obviously, began to implode. All right, let's open it up, or let's keep the stock picks coming. Steve wants to talk about TLT. Let's let's take a look at that gold and a couple other areas real quick. TLT looks okay. You have a bow tie working, but it's not off of like ten or twenty year lows. It's off of a couple year lows, so that's an okay signal. Uh, as I've said in plenty of other shows, I prefer a bow tie like this off of all time highs or five or ten year highs. Or a bow tie like this off of uh, all – not this is not all-time lows, but like 10 or 20-year lows, whatever the case may be, uh, as opposed to one that happens at mid-levels. But it's a signal nonetheless. And as a general statement, bonds have worked their way higher as of late. So we've sort of halfway dodged that interest rate bullet. And just be careful. And as someone has said recently in one of the timing research shows, and I fully agree, and I've said this personally myself, personally myself I've said this personally um, it's not the news that you know that you have to worry about it's the news that you don't know okay so yeah it was Greece and then it was uh, interest rates and then it was interest rates in Greece and, you know and then all of a sudden oh, it's China you know so it's always something out there but it's it's the things that you don't know that are going to hurt you in the markets. And you can't worry about them anyway. When we used to sail but race, we do if we hit a um, – when containers fall off a ship, sometimes they float about four inches under the water, and you're never going to see it. But if you hit it with a sailboat, it rips your keel off and you sink. Um, if you uh, if you hit a whale, you sink. If uh, you're a little closer to shore and it's uh, you've got an unlit rig, you hit an unlit rig, you sink. You know, if you hit some rocks, you sink. You can't sit around worrying about that because there's nothing you could do about it. So that's kind of how the news is when it comes to markets. It's not what you know that matters. It's what you don't know that blindsides the market. So just forget about the news, and your life will get a lot easier. But, yeah, interest rates was a big concern for a while, and now they're not so much a concern. And now they're actually going down, but now they're going back up a little bit. But so far, it looks like a bottom – at least the intermediate term bottom remains in place in bonds. But your major top so far remains in place in bonds until proven otherwise. Okay. Thoughts on symbol SKX? That's Skechers. Skechers or Skechers. Uh, this looks like a pretty serious short to me. I think this was listed as a short uh, recently by me. This is a first thrust lower. It's a pretty serious move lower, but so far it looks like a short. To me, and th this is a case where you wouldn't wait for that bow tie to fall because you already have a big thrust lower. So, yeah, that would be a possible short. And it looks pretty good as a short. And, you know, if you read the go-go nomo pattern, a stock like Skechers would certainly qualify. You want a single-dimensional company. You want a company that's splitting the atoms. I mean, they're making shoes, right? Um, I guess they're making something else by this point in time. but. Mostly a single-dimensional company. Phil, I like that one. It's on the Landry list, though, so I'm not going to cover it. So, yeah, I like that one. Okay, Tom Bowden says C. Okay, what do you want me to see? Oh, C. Yeah, this looks like another short, too. C, you know, C, this is um, many cases. Uh, in more recent shows, I've been like, Mikey, I hate everything. And uh, now in this show, everybody's going to say, oh, he loves everything, and he thinks everything's a short. But, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this looks like a short. The only thing I don't like, I don't like this gap against the trend. So I would probably pass based on that. But if today it filled that gap, then um, it might be worthy as a setup. But, yeah, it does look like it's in a lot of trouble. Another nice webinar. Thank you, Steve. EXPE. 
EXPE. Uh, yeah, again, <laughs> you know, another first thrust type of setup. It's got a little support right here, but it did kind of touch that support. So, yeah, that looks okay um, as a possible short. I can't, uh, I can't argue with it too much. There's so many shorts out there that I could probably find something a little bit better, but I certainly can't argue with this as a setup. I don't really like this gap up here, but yeah. And, but notice that within the setup, you have a gap down. It's kind of along the lines of reversal gap strategy. So you want to trade gaps in the direction of the trend or gaps in the direction of the setup, I should say, in this particular case when you're trading an emerging trend. So yeah, that looks pretty good. I guess I might need to start giving on high fives. Uh, RL for Jason. Uh, well, it's not set up yet. Okay. And here's the other thing, too. I'm a big fan of trend, as I've been preaching ad nauseum. But here's the case where this stock is in such a long term downtrend and it's been going down for so long. I think your better opportunities would be in the Skeechers and some of these other stocks, especially if you're in this consumer non durable area. Uh, but look to short the Skechers or something like that uh, and, and look up the go-go, no-go under free reports on my website. And then I think you're going to see that that's going to be a much better opportunity than waiting for this RL to pull back and look to trade some setups there. Okay. So, yeah, on a pullback, it could work. And as a trend follower, I certainly can't argue with you because it is persistent. It is accelerating lower. It does look like it's still in trouble. But I think your better opportunities are going to be in the stocks that are at higher levels. And that's a general way that I feel. In general, I usually feel that way about the short side. I prefer those at higher levels. And then, you know, when we get in the big market turn, I prefer the, the transitional setups coming off of major lows. Like in 2009, I was more excited about the energy stocks and, and all those stocks that were bottoming out right around that time, as opposed to the stocks that were already rallying or already up uh, significantly. I think your bigger opportunity at market turns is going to be the stocks that are turning with the market. Oh, write that down. That's, that's, that's profound. I think your best opportunities at market turns are those stocks that are turning with the market. Oh, my gosh. That's pretty good, if I say so myself. All right, Ernie wants to know about BAC. That's going to be a bank, obviously. Uh, yeah, it looks like a possible shard. It's kind of imploded significantly given the given the size of it. It's a little wide and loose longer term. It's a little thick, but actually thick's okay for the short side. I'm going to give that an okay. Um, at this juncture, I'd almost prefer a stock. Let me see if I can get a blank chart in here. At this juncture, I'd almost prefer a stock. I mean, you, you, you're on the right track because – you did pick a stock that was coming off of new highs and imploding. But at this juncture, I'd almost prefer a stock kind of like that Sketches. I guess I could have just popped the Sketches up. I'd almost prefer a stock that's kind of like doing this because you've got all these people trapped on the wrong side of the market as opposed to a stock that's been doing this and then beginning to implode. I think this has a potential to slide a lot more seriously than something that's done like this. Um, I get a lot of questions when I use the word priced or the phrase priced for perfection. And price for perfection simply means that a stock has been in a longer term uptrend and the whole world knows it's in an uptrend. You don't need a trend following moron like me to point out that it's above the moving averages or it's going higher on net net change. It's, the whole world knows it's going higher. Come on. OK, so by this point in time, once this trend is very mature, as some people like to say, everybody in the world knows about it. So it becomes what I call priced for perfection. And I don't think I invented that term. It's just a term that I use. And that means that the analysts are expecting great things for from the company. Everyone's expecting them. They're so good. It's like how much better what's left, you know, what's left in the stock. So they'll beat earning, say they beat earning estimates by 25%, but everybody was expecting them to beat earning estimates by 50%. So, and then the stock begins to implode. So it, it becomes this, this um, 
I'm trying to think of the best way to explain it. the blooms off the rose or whatever. It's just they're just priced for perfection. Everybody expects perfection from the company. And at that point, the company has become so mature in its cycle and all. It's kind of hard to continue to grow those earnings at 100 percent or whatever. Or it's kind of hard to beat the pants off the earnings at this stage of the game. Now, early on, I mean, that's what got the stock up here. So that's why those could be good uh, shorting opportunities. All right, Art has been patient, patient waiting, waiting patiently to talk about ACI. Thanks for taking the time to wait. ACI, I like. Um, it's not quite set up just yet, but I like it because one, it could trade contra to the overall market. Two, it's a coal stock, which means it could trade. I think that's my point. It could, could trade contra to the overall market. I guess two is that it's a bow tie. It does have some resistance here. But it's making such a strong move towards that resistance. It looks like it has a potential to cut through it like butter. So, yeah, on a pullback, I agree with you on that one. SYY, that's going to be what, Cisco or something? Um, no, uh, HV is a little low on this. I don't know what happened back here, but it's kind of just reached its prior peak in here, and it's kind of wide and loose longer term. So, uh, I would avoid a stock that looks like that in, in any market, not just this market. So I'd stay away from that. Are you, are you looking to short it? Uh, not really a short. It's just kind of all over the place. Dennis wants to know about LNCE. LNCE. Um, one thing that's kind of jumping out at me, when you first look at this chart, it looks pretty good. But then if you notice that, it kind of broke out above its prior peaks, then it came all the way back in. I mean, here's the deal. This is probably one of the best-looking stocks out there on the long side, okay? But that doesn't mean it's worth buying, okay? Because it just kind of barely got past its peaks, then it came right back in. But it looks okay. I mean, you could do much worse, certainly, in this market, but I'd leave it alone, okay? Brian has been patiently waiting for BXLT. BXLT. Um, I don't like the way that it just imploded all the way down here to its its uh, pre-IPO levels. Okay. So this would be a stock that I would avoid. It's just all over the place. So I would leave that one alone. Sorry to make you wait so long to, to tell you to avoid it. FL, same as Skechers. That's going to be what, Foot Locker? Yeah, pretty much. Um, your meltdown was over a few days in here. But, yeah, that looks fantastic. That's kind of gatekeeper looking. I'm always getting get a lot of questions about the gatekeeper. Gatekeeper I like on the short side more than the long side. But gatekeeper is just this big reverse check mark after markets coming up all-time highs. Absolutely. I mean, we're going to have a plethora of sales again tonight. Last night I had 40 shorts on my list and I really had took I really had my work cut out for me to whittle it down to just just one is what I decided on. But yeah, I mean there's a lot of shorts out there right now. Foot Locker and Skechers, they both qualify as Gogonomos. Visa, give me a, a symbol. Is it V? I forget. Is it V? Yeah, I don't know stocks by their um if you give this symbol I can tell you the stock, but if you give me the stock I can't give you the symbol. Does that make sense? Um, this one doesn't really jump out at me as much as some of those other ones. You just got this one huge wide range bar down in here. Um, so I would pass on that, but I certainly wouldn't rush out and buy it. But yeah, it's, it. I hear what you're saying. It's got the makings of like a, a first thrust. It's also got a bow tied here. TTC for Dennis. TTC. Uh, no, no, you got no. You know, look at things on a net net basis. Well, today's price, yeah, it's breaking out a little bit, but on a net net basis, you haven't gone anywhere since March. And then you did break out, but then you came all the way back into the base. So I would leave that one alone. Unless it made new highs and then pull back along the way. Also, HV really low. Only about fifteen on the HV. Okay. And volume a little low too, by the way. I hadn't pointed this out. A couple of one of those other stocks we were looking at earlier, I meant to mention. The volume was a little low on a couple of those. So just be watch your volume. Okay. All right. EXP, EXPD for Mr. Reese. EXPD. Now, 
The XPD? No. No, uh, it's wide and loose, okay? As I often say, if you can hear that electrocardiogram, let's see if we can find you one. Electrocardiogram. I can never spell that. Electrocardiogram. There you go. If you're looking at a stock and you can hear the, the beep, beep noise, okay, that's what a, that's a real electrocardiogram, you know, beep, 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 beep. Then it's a stock you don't want to be trading, okay? So it was kind of funny. I was um, I was in Italy, and I was worried that the audience wasn't getting me with the translation and everything. And then um, we got to the stock selection part, and we were looking at some great trends in stocks. And all of a sudden, we hit a couple that looked like this, and then the audience started going beep, 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 beep. But I was just – that was just a, kind of like a pinch me moment. It was, it was I was so excited uh, to hear that beep beep back, you know. So yeah, if you hear it going beep 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 beep, you want to avoid the stock. Yes, it's almost at new highs, but that's not a reason in and of itself to rush out and buy a stock and back it out longer term. You can see it's all over the place. It's got a longer term electrocardiogram look to it. Uh, it's an efficient stock, meaning that uh, by efficient I mean that. It's overtraded. A lot of analysts probably looking at this stock. A lot of funds probably own it. Okay, you're much better off getting at something that's a little bit more inefficient than trading these more efficient stocks. Now there is one caveat. Sometimes a big, thick, efficient stock can make a wonderful shorting opportunity, but obviously you don't want to short one that looks like electrocardiogram. Okay. All right, uh, Lucio says, hey, Dave, can you, uh, Lucio, uh, parlo italiano? Uh, hey, Dave, uh, if you can, can you explain why we shouldn't put in overnight stops and how to put the next day because I didn't understand that so well. Okay, a uh, little bit more involved lesson. We talk about this quite often, but let me see if I can cover that really quickly for you. Uh, in fact, this is a great little, uh, great little figure to use for this. Okay, let's say you put in now, – now, keep in mind, this is – if you're more advanced, if you're disciplined, okay, and if you're going to follow your plan and add a little discretion to that plan, then this is what you do. If you're not disciplined, then just leave your stop in, and you might even be able to use a so-called contingency order. I don't want to open up that, that can of worms the, or the complexity of the, of the contingency order, uh, at least not in this presentation. But to answer your question, let's say you've got a stop in here. And then you come in and futures are getting whacked about 4% like they were recently. And you know that this stock is probably going to open way down here or it's going to get hit really hard on the open. So what you do is you don't carry that stop overnight. Okay. So your stop would have been here. Let's say the stock opens down here somewhere. So you wait to see if it does one or two things. One, if it keeps going down, you have to have a point at which you'll get out, okay? I know your name's Italian, or if um, in, in the States we have something called uncle point, uh, this would be a point where you can't take any more pain. Now, that's not saying throw caution to the wind. Let's say you're trading a $30 stock. Let's say your stop's at $25. Let's say it opens at uh, 24 and then it trades down. You give it like one extra point. Let's say it trades at 23 if it goes through 23, then you got to get out, okay? Get out, okay? But if it reverses before it hits that level, begins to rally, then you could do a couple things. You could either improve upon your exit. Like if you get whacked, let's say, 10 points overnight in the stock, and let's say it comes back six points intraday, well, you might exit when it's up five or six or seven points, okay? That's one thing you could do. And sometimes, if it's not too severe of a drop lower, you could actually end up staying with the stock for a longer-term trend, okay? So that's a, a little bit of damage control. If you look at the second half of the layman's guide to trading stocks, it's in there. And I talk about it uh, uh, quite often in these weekend chart shows, as we just did. So go back in and watch as many of um, those weekend charts as you can. Okay, any uh, any more stocks? AAOL for Mr. Reese. Oh, AAOI, AAOI. Uh, this stock looks like it's in trouble. 
it's only dropped a couple of points, which isn't that big of a deal for a stock that has an HP of of 63. It's got a little support down here. Uh, I think I would pass, but yeah, I hear what you're saying. Also, it's not coming off of all-time highs. Uh, I think it's in trouble, but I don't think I would rush out and short it for those reasons. EFOI for Peter. EFOI. A lot of new faces in here today. Good to see you. Um, and yeah, if this is your first show, I'm, I, a lot of you guys, I'm not beating up on you. I'm just showing you my way of doing it, but it's not my way or highway. If there's something you like to do, then I'll, by all means do it. This one's been on my momentum list for quite a while. Um, I don't know when I put it in, but it's been on quite a few of uh, my momentum. Let's see, right there. Yeah, I've had it quite a few of these lists because it's headed, there it is, Landry 100, uh, because it's it's headed higher, okay? So, yeah, on a pullback, I wouldn't rush out and buy it today. Although, if you are running like a... a a portfolio of 100 stocks, and you see a stock make a new highs, then by all means, put a stock in. Yeah, you know, I've met some people uh, in my travels that that are running money, and believe it or not, they're actually just pretty much their main rule is they just buy stocks when they make new highs. Now, keep in mind they're buying a lot of stocks. A lot of times you buy a stock if it makes a new high, and next day it might begin to straight implode and correct. That's why, as a private trader, you don't want to rush out and do that. But as a if you're running a fund, then, yeah, you could buy a bunch of stocks, and that's what, exactly what I do in my Landry 100 is I only buy stocks for that list, and that's that's not an actually traded list. That's just my momentum list that I watch, and that's how I do about this EFOI. That's a wonderful exercise by keeping your own momentum list. I would strongly urge you to do that. takes a little time. takes a little work. Every day I do it, I'm thinking, geez, do I really feel like doing this? But I know that there's a payoff for me in that it's going to keep me looking at these momentum stocks. It's going to let me see what stocks are making new highs. Where's that leadership going? And also where's the leadership leaving? And that's good. That's a wonderful exercise. So yeah, um, it looks fantastic, but wait for a pullback on that one. Get a little bit on the uh, crazy side though. By crazy, look at the historical volatility getting a little bit too high. 139. That's a tough, that's a tough stock to trade. Once that volatility expands that much, so I'd be super careful on a pullback. Jim says, great job. Thank you. You're welcome, Jim. Uh, we're getting close to the uh, hour and a half cutoff. Any uh, any final questions we want to squeeze in real quick? Any stock picks? Be happy to do that for you. Thanks, Dave. Good show. Thanks, Nate. Hey, Don's here. Don wants to know about Ford. <laughs> That's odd. Well, okay, here's the beauty of following the trend. Now, I didn't say rush out and short Ford, but I've been drawing this down arrow in Ford for a while, okay? And then it's dropped. I think it's safe to say it's dropped at least 50% since I drew that drop down arrow. So, yeah, uh, avoid Ford at all costs. But, yeah, it's bouncing off its lows, and now it's going to have a lot of overhead supply to overcome. Great show as always. Thank you, Don. I appreciate that. I pick on Don sometimes. But he takes it. He's a good sport. Jillian, um... I think you could find something better to short. I'm always a little scared to short biotech. Not that I won't do it, but this one's kind of wide and loose and all over the place. It's also super crazy uh, thick. Not that I wouldn't avoid a super thick stock for shorting, but uh, it's just it just chops around based on the volume, I guess is a good way of putting it. So I think I would leave that one alone. Peter wants to know about Caesars. Does Caesar really live here? No, I didn't. I didn't think so. Uh, no, it's kind of all over the place. Um, it's got a lot of overhead supply along the ways. I hear what you're saying. It's kind of bottoming out, but it's going to have a hard time uh, beginning to rally. You're welcome, Mike. WTW. WTW looks pretty good. That one keeps finding its way to my watch list, and I keep taking it off. Uh, it has bow tied. It has bottomed, okay? But it does, um, it does have some overhead supply to deal with. So, um, yeah, Don looks good as a, looks good. At least recently it looked good, but now it's, now it's kind of sideways in here. I think I would avoid it just on that, but also because you have some overhead supply, but yes, it's definitely bottomed. Maybe if you can get back up above this overhead supply and set up again, then you have to deal with this gap back here. So it's a stock that initially when I look at it, it looks fantastic, but I can kind of pick it apart. 
Suppose the stock was at seven and then it drops to three, but it presents a short opportunity. Can you short it if we have a little margin for the stock to go down? Well, it, here's the thing. No matter where a stock is priced, you could only make 100% on the short. Okay, so that's that's the quick answer to that. Um, ideally, I prefer shorting a stock as it's coming off of highs. Now, the other thing, you're not really supposed to short stocks below $5 a share. I think legally you could do it, but most brokers won't let you short stocks less than $5 a share. But I don't think that's the question you're asking. I think you're asking if something is already in a downtrend, can you still short it? And the answer is absolutely. It just works better a little bit coming over top uh, or after, right after a top has formed. I'm trying to fit too much in in the last few minutes. So my apologies, but I like to get it as much as I can doing these shows. So, but yeah, you can short them along the way. And sometimes you can add back to a core short position. And that's how you could make more than 100% on a short uh, on the way down. But that's a little bit more advanced for today's show. Give it a time. Thomas, Starbucks. Um, well, the drop is a little bit too extreme given the volatility of the stock. So I don't think I would rush out and try to short it. But if this drop wasn't so extreme, then, yeah, that has the, all the makings of a, a go-go no-mo. In fact, that's probably what I'll be looking for tonight is those uh, go-go no-go. Martin wants to know about TSLA, uh, which is Tesla. It's just kind of wide and loose and all over the place. I think you could probably find something better out there. Uh, shorter term, yeah, it still looks like it's in trouble. It looks like a retrace. But, uh, again, you know, notice it, it, it shoots up, drops, shoots up, drops, shoots up, drops. I think I'd avoid that as a possible trade. You're welcome, Don. Other Don. <laughs> we have more than one Don here. A few Dons here. DXCM. All right, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, yeah, this stock looks like it's in trouble. It did have this gap here. It's kind of like thrown all the way back up to its highs. Uh, this wide range bar, a little bit extreme. So I would avoid this one, but I hear what you're saying. It kind of has that gatekeeper look to it. Uh, if anything, yeah, you could short it, but it's 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 retraced so close to its old highs. I think I would leave it alone in here. It's just too crazy. Okay, um, I guess uh, what was that show? Let's be careful out there. I think that's probably the best thing I can tell you right now. Uh, I appreciate all you guys coming. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm humbled by your appearance. Without you, there is no show, obviously. Uh, anything unanswered? Dave at DaveLandry.com. You're welcome, Alvin. You're welcome, Thomas. Appreciate it. You're welcome, Martin. You're welcome, Luca. All right, uh, I think that's it. Uh, again, any other questions, any answer questions, DavidDaveLander.com. And I guess uh, everyone have a great weekend if we don't talk again. And hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much. Hill Street Blues, thank you.